Thank you. Thank you, uh, Margot, for such a warm welcome and introduction. Uh, I'm super excited to be here today. What an honor for me to be back here after I graduated from Stanford 10 years ago. And what's more important is to be among the WEEDS community. Thank you all for having me. So uh, I am super excited to share with you some of the early effort that we have at LinkedIn. Uh, with regarding creating global economic opportunity with responsible data science. First and foremost, I want to say that what I'm going to be talking about, the work I'm sharing today, is impossible without many bright individuals uh, from LinkedIn. And I cannot give them enough credit. And of course, if you don't like the material, it's all them as well. <laughs> So at LinkedIn, uh, we have this vision of creating economic opportunity for every member of the global workforce. And the data on the LinkedIn platform constitutes what we call the economic graph. And the economic graph is really a digital representation of the global economy. And with data generated from interactions and uh, in engagements from millions of members, millions of companies, thousands of skills and, and, and schools, and so on and so forth. And with all this data and the insights, we can ask many important questions important to understanding the economy, understanding the future of the workforce. So what we do is we actually collaborate with many global institutes across the world, such as G20, World Bank, World Economic Forum, to tackle uh, those questions and really helping them design economic uh, interventions that is really able to help us to be better prepared for the future. As an example, uh, our data is able to help us understand what kind of skills are trending over time, right? What is the kind of imbalance that we see in between the supply and demand of various different skills across different geographic locations? I'm sure everyone here is excited to see that data science as a skill is really, the gap is really widening over time. There's much, much more demand over time as we see with regarding this kind of skill and it's really across many different geographic locations as well. And we can also split the data uh, by gender. It's probably not surprising to people in this room, but it's certainly concerning that we only have about 20% of AI professionals who are females, right? And this is really across different geographic countries and everywhere. And what's even more concerning is if I take a cut of this data by industries, so AI professionals, the gap, the gender gap among AI professionals is way wider. And it's even the case among industries such as education and healthcare, which really were industries historically have been very popular among female professionals. And we saw earlier, right, the data science AI skills has really been training. There's more and more demand for skills like that. And this is really putting us at risk of widening the gender and equity gap. And it's really gonna take everyone here in this room and way beyond for us to figure out how we can make sure that the trend does not continue. So now let's come back to this little blue button on your phone. Hopefully, every single person in this room now feel as much as I do, both the opportunity and also the responsibilities that this little button has as we try to create economic opportunity for every person in the global workforce. So what role does data science play in this? So let's first take a look at what's underneath that little blue button. There's certainly a lot that goes on behind the blue button. And uh, not the least, the massive data infrastructure that we are able to use and build to process over eight terabytes of events that happens every single day. And obviously, to process all this and compute all these data sets, we have to have nearly half a million of offline jobs that runs every single day. And all that data and its potential really comes with a set of responsibilities. And by responsibilities, I don't mean just the regulations such as GDPR and CCPA and beyond. These are table stakes. 
I really mean what earlier in the panel that you hear, Lucy was saying, it's really the values. It's really about what is the right thing to do. If we, Ellington, really truly believe the value of member first, we truly believe the value of creating economic opportunity for everyone. So, and it all has to start with how we are preserving the privacy of our members as we are leveraging the data that the members entrust with us. So, I think everyone here uh, probably have been trained over the years that do not give out sensitive information, such as your name, address, your social security number. But did you know that 87% of people in the United States that a hacker can still reconstruct your identity based on purely the attributes of your date of birth, your gender, and your zip code. That's why exactly the traditional techniques such as obfuscation or key anonymity is no longer sufficient to protect and to defend attacks such as the difference in attacks or reconstruction attacks. And this is why exactly we are investing into differential privacy. Differential privacy has really become this new standard when it comes to data privacy protection. And at a very high level, the concept is actually very simple, right? So you have a set of data. What you can learn from the data should be the same with or without a single individual's data to be part of it. So here in this graph that I'm showing you, essentially the distribution here is what we can learn from this set of users. And if I actually remove one user's data from this set, and the difference of the, between the new distribution that I learned and the old distribution that I had should be very small. This was a concept that was introduced uh, by Cynthia Dork et al. Uh, back, uh, over almost 15 years ago. Um, and essentially the mathematical definition is to say that differential privacy is able to guarantee that the privacy loss that we have is bounded by this epsilon and with very high probability. So, um, Alan Jing, what we're working towards is really using differential privacy to be the default way that we're sharing data externally. And the way that obviously we share data externally can be coming through various different data applications, uh, including the, applic the analytics dashboards, the data APIs, or even our ML models as well. And it's a very challenging problem. Uh, and we are still uh, very early uh, in our uh, in, our, in our progress towards where we want it to be. Um, but we, we have made some good progress, um, in particular on the global differential privacy model front. Uh, I'm gonna share a little bit of it, uh, both from the algorithm standpoint and also from the systems that we have been building. So uh, recently, uh, folks in my team actually, uh, they were able to share uh, some of the new development they have uh, in the algorithm that they call Top K algorithm at the uh, New York's conference. So for those of you who are really interested in getting to know more details, certainly uh, uh, take a look at their paper. Uh, but at a high level, their paper is really trying to tackle uh, putting differential privacy on this set of query that is extremely common um, in, in how usually uh, companies share data externally. Queries such as, can you give me the top 10 articles on LinkedIn that has the most comments? So besides uh, when, we, when we are building a differential privacy algorithm in production, certainly there is a lot of practical constraints on those algorithms, of, and not, not the least that it has to be extremely performant, low latency and everything. But I think this set of query in particular relative to some other queries, the challenge it has is this subtlety of a single user can actually impact the ranking of multiple different articles. Right? Thinking about how you can both guarantee or meet the differential privacy guarantee at the same time that you are able to still return useful information and then um, and how can we do that? So, so please uh, take a look at their paper in detail. But actually achieving differential privacy, uh, uh, the, the way that we're using it um, in practice, we cannot just stop at designing new algorithms. 
More importantly, we also need to make sure that we are able to build systems that is able to interface between the data storage that we have and also the applications that we have. That is the way that we can actually scale the adoption of differential privacy and making it so much easier for all the, uh, the applications that are leveraging data to be leveraging a differentially private way. So we have also uh, built the system, uh, which is really a differential privacy meteor that is able to speak between the data stores and the data applications uh, that not only has a suite of DP algorithms uh, to choose from, but also at the same time has this very important um, a component that we call a privacy budget management system, which is able to keep track of how much privacy loss uh, that is happening over time, so that we can make sure that the privacy loss is not just sort of a one-time thing, but over time we are able to guarantee uh, what we, we set out to be with our algorithms. So again, we also have another paper that right now is in archive. I highly recommend everyone who is interested to read it as well. So um, now coming to uh, the second part of my topic, uh, obviously be responsible with data. Uh, it doesn't mean just how we can preserve uh, the privacy, but also as we are leveraging the data that our members entrust us, that we wanted to make sure that we are creating opportunities in a fair way as well. So uh, um, in the earlier panel, there was a lot of discussions on algorithm bias, right? So I'm sure everyone here is very familiar with this. And obviously, really kudos to uh, Joy Bulanwini who popularized or put this really in a spotlight over almost four years ago with her project Coded Gaze and really highlighted the fact that how the, the, the top algorithms, the facial recognition algorithms, were actually really not uh, uh, having uh, the right accuracy, accuracy um, um, when, we, when thinking about detecting both light-skinned men versus uh, uh, dark-skinned women. But fairness is not just about algorithms, right? Uh, earlier, uh, Lucy uh, actually mentioned about how uh, it, it's, it's really about the various different values uh, that we are creating to the, to the, to the society. And, and then if you're thinking about there's various different values that LinkedIn as a platform is providing to the society, and it, there's many different ways, right? How we're building the product, the new features that we are iterating, um, and in various different ways. And it's a very challenging problem. Um, uh, uh, I, I believe that everyone here would agree with me, right? There's multitude of views, and the world outside LinkedIn may not be fair, right? Even thinking about should we aim for equal treatment or equal outcome, right? Judging by the fact that Margot earlier <laughs> gave wooden stools of different heights, I think she's a believer of uh, equal outcome. <laughs> um, but there, there is way more. So just to give a example uh, to see why this is such a challenging problem. So if I ask everyone here to say, hey, if you um, uh, have all the power to design a fair job product, how would you design it, right? Talking about uh, uh, fairness by design. And it's super challenging. Um, so, so you can think about, hey, I wanted to design a jobs product that is able to make sure for male and female that they are getting equally good job recommendations. But that's definitely not, we, we can't end there, right? Because we have to also make sure that men and women are applying to jobs equally, they are getting hired to jobs equally. And more importantly, they are getting hired equally to equally good jobs with equally good pay. And now you're thinking about there's many different ways that we deliver value, not just jobs, right? Many other ways we have to think through. Um, uh, it's certainly a, a very challenging problems overall. So I'm going to just share at a very high level uh, the, the three dimensions uh, that we are trying to tackle uh, or try to approach fairness using data. So first of all, uh, we uh, adopted the equal opportunity framework uh, that was introduced by Hartz et al. Uh, uh, in their 2016 New York's paper, uh, which is really saying that you know, we believe the opportunities that individuals can get on LinkedIn sh should really be uh, in the, uh, given the talent and, and effort should really be independent of many other attributes such as gender, ethnicity, and so on and so forth. And to put it in 
uh, plain English. Uh, so the fairness mission that we have is really try to enable that, ensure that two people with equal talent should have an equal shot at opportunities. And these opportunities uh, are not just on for jobs, it's about opportunities to engage with various different contents, opportunities to build network, to find mentors, get jobs, learn, get endorsements, and so on and so forth, right? So the second thing, uh, the second dimension that, that we're looking at is, uh, is really about thinking about what are the things that is really helping individuals get opportunities. There's been historically so many social uh, research that has done that has uh, helped us uh, understand this way better, right? For example, we know that what helps people getting opportunity uh, is trust, is a status, uh, is access to information. So what are those specific assets that we have at LinkedIn that is able to help individuals to get that? And one uh, research that we did, as example, is uh, not surprisingly, right? Social capital matters to career. Uh, but in, in, uh, in the LinkedIn setting, it's not just social capital as in how many connections you have, but it's really about how diverse your connections are, right? So, um, and obviously individual, individuals who have a much more structurally diverse network, they actually are more likely to be mobile in the labor market. So last but not least, we've got to take actions. We've got to make changes, right? And then a lot of things that we make changes are starting with measurement. And we measure from multiple different uh, aspects. And I'm going to go through uh, some of the, the examples in, in a bit more detail. As an example, we, we track uh, and understand the distributions of the way that people are getting value uh, based on their particular attributes, right? Students versus non-students. As you can tell, the students certainly are, you know, relative to non-students, they actually have a very large network. But if you're looking at the structural diversity of the network, not very good. Right? So then as we are building product, we are constantly thinking about, hey, how can we help students such that we can bridge them into those clusters of opportunities who can help them really landing on those opportunities in their career. And another example is uh, thinking about how we really can present or ensure that everyone is visible to recruiters. Right? We have this uh, matrix that is called skillness at K, uh, which is really try to measure how representative is our top search results relative to the whole qualified candidates sets. And uh, one thing uh, that uh, I didn't mention earlier, which is really at LinkedIn, obviously we are uh, very experimentation driven. So every single thing that we change on our products, we really wanted to understand, is this really bring benefits to the members or not, right? So we go through an experiment uh, process and, and we are able to actually, since I'm running out of time, that I'm going to <laughs> jump really quick on this one, which is really able to uh, see whether the, the, um, what we bring, the values that we bring to our members, are they actually concentrated on a small set or are we actually uh, uh, sort of having an equal distribution across the board? And we borrow some old uh, economics concepts such as Atkinson's index for us to achieve that and such that we can detect unintended consequences in every product launch. And thank you. <laughs> Thanks, yeah. <laughs>